Well, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about the Washington Report. As Allison said, we're almost 30 years old. And it was founded in 1982 by retired American Foreign Service officers who spent their careers in the Middle East and who believed then and still believe now that the American public is not getting the full story on what is happening with Israel's occupation of Palestine and how the U.S. How the US is making that possible. This is the first issue of our magazine that we published on April 5, 1982. And in it, we were covering APAC already. And at the time, it was laying the groundwork for a potential fight to stop any sale to Jordan of improved anti-aircraft missiles. And this is what our magazine, our current issue, looks like today. And it's a coincidence, but a convenient one, that this issue has the totals of pro-Israel PAC contributions for all candidates in the 2010 elections. And there are copies back on the table. If you haven't picked one up already, P please feel free to do so. We started covering pro-Israel PACs in 1986. And in 1990, we published the book Stealth PACs by our executive editor, Richard Curtis, and he, in fact, coined the name, the term stealth packs, and as I recall at the time, the stealth bomber was much in the news, and it just seemed like a natural fit to describe how these packs work. And these, this book covers the 1978 to 1996 elections. There's a chapter on each election and what was happening at the time, and also there's the contributions for every candidate each year. There's um, an overview of PACs, and the index has a list of all 128 PACs that were active at that time. So we have copies of our few remaining copies for sale upstairs if anyone is interested at $10, I believe, a piece. But it's a great resource, an historical resource, and unfortunately, much of the information is still pertinent. I get a lot of calls from people who ask me, so how much money, can you tell me how much money APAC gives to my candidate? And the first thing I said is, APAC does not make campaign contributions. I mean, if this is a big mistake people make, and I think it's, you really have to be careful not to accuse APAC of doing something that it can deny, and then just let itself off the hook. Now, we don't make campaign contributions. Well, that's quite true. But the Federal Election Commission, sorry, classifies APEC as a membership organization. It doesn't classify it as a political committee. And what this means is that APAC does not have to reveal its sources of income or its expenditures to anyone. This is not information that's available to the public. And I heard Professor Walt upstairs say, well, APAC is an American organization. All its contributions come from Americans. We don't know that. We don't know where it gets its money from. So it may be true, but we don't know. But a, a memo leaked to the Washington Post in 1998 revealed that APAC exercises a high degree of oversight and coordination over these smaller PACs, and Grant Smith has enlarged this memo for your viewing pleasure. It was written by APAC's Assistant Director of Political Affairs, Elizabeth Schreyer, and instructs a subordinate to pressure several of these PACs to give money to specific candidates. Some of the PACs are ICE PAC, Connecticut PAC, Georgia PAC, Gold Coast PAC. A lot of these are no longer active, but they were among the 128 that were at one point active. And one of the candidates who's mentioned frequently in that memo is Tom Daschle, who was a House member making his first Senate run. And so a lot of these items are saying, give some of this to Daschle, give more to Daschle, give more to Daschle. He ended up receiving $262,130 in that Senate campaign, which he won, and he went on to become the Senate Majority Leader. And I'm sure he remembers where he got his money in his first race for the Senate. And so I think this memo makes clear that APAC is involved in coordinating the activities of these PACs and that the favored candidates are not chosen at random. <coughs> On January 12, 1989, less than a year after this memo was leaked, the publisher and executive editor of the Washington Report, Andrew Kilgore and Richard Curtis, joined several other distinguished Americans, including former Ambassador James Akins, former Undersecretary of State George Ball, and former Congressman Paul Finley in a lawsuit against the Federal Election Commission. Now, when we talk about it, we say we call it the case against APAC, but it was actually against the Federal Election Commission. 
And the purpose was to get the Federal Election Commission to classify APAC as a political committee and thereby reveal this information that nobody knows about. Nine years after the case was filed, on January 14, 1998, it was heard by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court sent it back to the lower court because the FEC was in the process of revamping its membership criteria. And so the Supreme Court said, well, you're changing your rules, so let's see what, uh, how it all ends up. And surprisingly, APAC totally fit in with their new rules. So it's still class, APAC completely fit in with its new rules. And then finally, in last September, more than two decades after the case was first filed, it was dismissed by U.S. District Court Judge Richard J. Leon. And what that did really was close the, the door to the avenue of using the Federal Election Commission as a means to find out this information about APAC. And Grant and Jeff will discuss the means that they are <coughs> pursuing today. So even though APAC, or even though the FEC has given APAC a free pass, the 30-odd pro-Israel PACs that are active today have to adhere to its regulations. And those regulations say that PACs can give $10,000 per candidate per election year. So they can give $5,000 for the primary election and another $5,000 for the general election. Now, as Tom Daschle's case demonstrates, <coughs> $10,000 is chicken feed. I mean, that's ridiculous. They're not going to only give $10,000. He got $260,000, where if there was only one PAC for the pro-Israel lobby, that person would get $10,000. So not only does the favored candidate benefit, but the extent of the lobby's influence on American elections is hidden from view as well. For example, there is no pro-Israel PAC. Whenever you see top 10 PACs in either the Washington Post or what I'm talking about right now is the Center for Responsive Politics, which is an excellent resource. Their website is opensecrets.org. They never list a pro-Israel PAC among the top 10 PACs because each specific PAC is relatively small. So they, Open Secret says that the top PAC is the National Association of Realtors, and they gave $3.7 million in 2010. Honeywell International gave $3.6 million, and the National Beer Wholesalers Association gave $3,300,000. But as a group, pro-Israel PACs gave $3,310,000, $490. So if you look at that as one lobby, which is actually how they act, they're number three. They were number three in 2010. By comparison, in 2010, the two Arab American PACs, which are the Arab American Leadership Council PAC and the Arab American Political Action Committee, gave a total of $36,500 in campaign contributions. That's 1% of the amount that the pro Israel PACs gave. In other words, pro Israel PACs gave 100 times almost the amount as Arab American PACs. Now, pro-Israel PACs have several interesting characteristics. First of all, in their FEC filings, they list themselves as unaffiliated. They're not connected with any sponsor, any major organization. Most PACs have no problem identifying their affiliation or industry. For example, the seven PACs under the National Association of Realtors umbrella, which Open Secrets listed as the top PAC for 2010, all list their industry as real estate agents. And each of the seven PACs includes in its name the word Association of Realtors. So it's pretty clear where they're coming from. By contrast, only three of the 30 PACs listed as pro-Israel by Open Secrets give any indication of their agenda. Those PACs are the World Alliance for Israel, the Republican Jewish Coalition, and the National Jewish Democratic Council. All the others have innocuous, one might even say misleading names, such as the National Action Committee, Northern Californians for Good Government, the Maryland Association for Concerned Citizens, City PAC, Delaware Valley PAC, Desert Caucus, and so on. What this means is that even if the, you're the most conscientious voter in the world and you're looking up who's contributing to your candidate, and these groups are contributing to your candidate, you don't know that they're pro-Israel PACs. You would have no idea. So it's, it's really operating under the radar. What's most striking about these 30-odd PACs, however, is their pattern of giving. Once you've read the FEC filings of a couple of them, it's almost completely predictable who the rest will be giving to. And I've gone through these printouts myself. They used to be these big green printouts. And once you've read the first couple, it was you might as well just replicate them over and over. There is no suspense involved, let me tell you. 
<laughs> These packs operate in lockstep to such an extent that some of the packs that nominally represent a state don't give to a single candidate from that state. And last year, that Northern Californians and the Maryland PACs neither gave to a candidate from California or Maryland. Pro-Israel PACs prefer to give to pliable incumbents rather than to challengers, regardless of religion. There are some exceptions, of course. Last year in Illinois, incumbent Representative Jam Sh Jan Schakowsky received a measly $2,145 from pro-Israel PACs, while her challenger, Joel Pollack, received a slightly less measly $6,500. And usually, the, the PACs will give to an incumbent. I mean, they want to hedge their bets, and if that incumbent gets reelected, they don't want to be on their, on their bad side. So, but you can tell by reading these figures who, who they're looking after, who they're promoting. They also give priority to members of committees responsible for issues of concern to Israel, such as foreign affairs, armed forces, budget committees, et cetera. Representative Howard Berman of California, for example, chaired the House Foreign Affairs Committee when the Democrats controlled Congress, and he's now the ranking member. A few years ago, he told the Forward newspaper, even before I was a Democrat, I was a Zionist. Pro-Israel PACs also like to extend their largesse to American legislators in leadership positions. One such example is Representative Steny Hoyer of Maryland, who's now the House Minority Whip. His take from pro-Israel PACs used to be, pretty average or even a little below average, but as he climbed up the leadership ladder, he got more and more contributions from these pro-Israel PACs. Another tactic favored by pro-Israel PACs is called bundling. And this is when they'll have individuals write a check to a candidate and then the PAC or lobby representative will collect them all and take them and deliver them to that candidate. So the candidate knows who they're coming from, but they're not direct contributions from the PAC itself, so they don't get reported to the FEC as a PAC contribution. Bundling began to become popular around 1994 when talk of campaign finance was in the air. It's a way to minimize the extent of PAC contributions. So most traditional pro-Israel PACs use bundling as a way to disguise the full extent of their financial involvement. And I remember when all of a sudden the totals kind of went down. You know, they used to be like, like uh, Dashiell got 200 something thousand dollars. That's, that doesn't happen anymore. But there's a lot of other contributions coming in through the side. But an interesting exception is the one pro-Israel PAC that uses bundling to increase its appearance of political involvement, and that is the J Street PAC. It, J Street PAC had a very, this is from its website, J Street PAC had a very successful 2008 cycle, endorsing 41 candidates, 33 of which were successful. The PAC distributed more than $575,000 to its endorsees, making it the largest pro-Israel PAC. According to J Street's SBC filings, however, its direct contributions to 2008 candidates totaled 44,521, making it the 22nd largest pro-Israel PAC. So what it did was it funneled $500,000 to candidates through it, in effect bundling it. You can go to their website and pick which candidate and then donate to that candidate, and they're counting that as their contribution to a candidate, but it's not actually from the PAC. So so both the traditional PACs and J Street are using bundling to kind of disguise the extent of their involvement, but uh, their involvement is still very significant. Rather than get into a discussion about the uh, alleged invincibility of the Israel lobby of APAC and these pro-Israel PACs, I have one name to say, and that is Rand Paul. You could tell he was Israel's nightmare, as he has since proven to be when he called it for an end to foreign aid, including foreign aid to Israel, by his campaign contribution figures. His Republican primary opponent got 33,000, oh sorry, yeah. His Republican primary opponent got $33,500 from pro-Israel PACs, and the Democratic candidate got 16,250. Rand Paul got just $2,000. <laughs> so they were not anxious to see him in the Senate. Even the candidate who got the most pro-Israel PAC contributions last year, Senator Mark Kirk, who now holds President Obama's seat from Illinois, barely won his election, despite a massive, for now, $115,304 in pro-Israel PAC contributions. And this is a page from Senator Mark Kirk's campaign website. Well, it has his name in Hebrew. It's in the, actually in the colors of the Israeli flag. Yes, and now I first became aware of him in 2006 
when he got more pro-Israel PAC contributions than Shelley Berkeley of Nevada, who until then was the queen of House pro-Israel PAC contributions. And by the way, I was dismayed to learn recently that Berkeley is going to be running for Senate in 2012 for the seat vacated by John Ensign, so she and Kirk may be colleagues once again. At any rate, Kirk's history of pro-Israel PAC contributions is instructive. When he first ran in 2000, he got $7,068. The next election, he got $17,500. In 2004, he got $28,750. In 2006, the year he passed Shelley Berkeley, he got $76,564, and then became the highest House recipient for that year. In 2008, he got $91,200. Now, that was when I knew he was going to run for Obama's seat. I mean, those are Senate figures. That's how much they give to Senate. They don't give that much money to House candidates. And for the 2010 Senate election, he got $115,304. And he was, in fact, the top recipient of anyone in the House or the Senate of pro-Israel campaign contributions in 2010. And before he even, this is from our current issue, before he even took his oath of office, he was number 10 on the top 10 career total list of Senate recipients of pro-Israel PAC. So he's ahead of the game. And what really infuriated me about, well, and then you can see why he's been getting increasingly <laughs> amounts of money. And he, he identifies on his website, if you go and look for his position on this issue, you come up with this. But other than that, his record in support of Israel was rarely mentioned. I've never heard him described as anything but a moderate Republican in any medium. But he talks about what he's done to deserve his support from PACs. He's a Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer, and he secured U.S. agreement to shared satellite surveillance information with Israel. He also led the bipartisan effort to secure real-time satellite early warning data for the State of Israel. This is from his website. He led a bipartisan effort to deploy the X-band ANTPY2 radar system to Israel. And earlier last year, he helped reverse the administration's cuts to Israel's IRO-3 upper tier missile defense system, securing full funding for the program to continue. So in other words, he guaranteed that the American taxpayer would pay the entire cost for Israel's IRO uh, missile defense program. And he's quite proud of that fact. So I'll just, I'm about to conclude, so I'll do it quickly. This is why it's so important for American voters to educate themselves about these pro-Israel PACs. They really operate under the radar. You have to look them up. You have to, we, we start publishing it the year of the election, what the latest totals are. And uh, also opensecrets.org is an excellent site. And they, if you go under PACs, single issue, uh, ideology, single issue PACs, you'll find yeah, it's opensecrets.org, and you can look under PACs, and then they have different kinds of PACs. And if you look under single issue, ideology single issue PACs, you'll find pro-Israel PACs. And they list the PACs and who they contribute to. You can find out, you know, who's giving to what candidate. And that's go an ongoing elect. They file it all the time. It's updated all the time. Um, so we'll continue covering this issue, and um, I've also put another handout back there. This is the, the list of all the senators and when they're up for re-election, how much they've gotten over their careers for pro-Israel PACs. I think it's hard to get all the Senate information in one place, so I think this is a good resource and that there's a handout back there and you're welcome to take it. And good luck voting in 2012. <laughs>